Hello and welcome today. It's wonderful to have you joining us online today. And I want to just say a special uh, happy Mother's Day to all the mums who are here today and all the motherly figures today. It's wonderful to have you uh, joining us here online. I appreciate the many challenges uh, that such a day brings for many uh, women in particular. And I'm glad that we could spend just a moment today uh, celebrating uh, women, but also just recognizing uh, the significant challenges that today does bring and have a time just to come and pray uh, for people uh, today. So I'm glad we could have that moment. But what I do want to do is just take a, a moment now just to, to celebrate uh, my wife, Ellie. Today is uh, only her second uh, Mother's Day. And uh, I just want to uh, celebrate her and because uh, Ellie, you're a wonderful mum uh, to our little boy, uh, Tommy. Uh, I just want to say thank you for who you are. I love the way that you love him, you nurture him you, and you teach him and uh, all the amazing things that he's uh, learned through your uh, your uh, nurturing uh, is just um, yeah incredible. So I just want to honour that uh, today. You're incredibly resilient, patient, uh, very kind, uh, and create a wonderful, safe environment uh, for him, and very gifted. And so Tommy uh, is blessed to have you as his uh, mum. Whether or not even I know, well, I know he realises it now but I'm sure in the future too, he will uh, celebrate that even more. So just wanted to take a moment just to, to celebrate and honor you, hun, and the flourishing that uh, Tommy is getting under your wings. And speaking of, speaking of Tommy, uh, Tommy is now 14 months old. It's amazing. Uh, and while there's a, a lot of things that, that Tommy can do, uh, he can sign and tell us that he is either uh, full and he wants no more food or he's hungry and wants more food, he can do that. He can climb on the couch and off the couch again. And the one thing that I'm really uh, excited about is that he can uh, mark a football and he can swing a great golf club. So um, there's a lot of joy coming from, uh, from me about all of those things. So there's plenty of things that he can do. But there's also plenty of things that uh, Tommy can't do at the moment. Um, like Here's a few. He can't cook his own food. Um, we've been trying. Um, it would be really helpful if he could because it would mean that we wouldn't have to prepare his food, but he can't. He's not able to drive yet. So we have to drive him around everywhere at the moment. Um, and he doesn't even know how to lodge his own tax return yet. And so in the next few months, I'm going to have to give him a bit of a hand to work out how to do, to do that. But, but here's the thing, right? These are uh, these are all jokes, of course, because none of us would expect him to do these things yet. And why? Well, it's because he's only 14 months old. See, Tommy can't just click his fingers and all of a sudden he becomes 21. No, Tommy can't help being a baby. It's, it, it, it's, it takes time to grow up. None of us, I wasn't, you weren't fully grown when you were born. We all come into, into life as a baby and we then progress into adulthood. And so growing up is a process. And the same is true when it comes to us growing in our faith and growing up in our faith. It is it is a process. When we become a Christian, we are like a, a spiritual infant when we begin. And sure, there's no doubt about it. We're filled with the, the spirit and the power of God. Amen. But that doesn't mean that the next day we'll automatically just wake up and perfectly live out the words, the ways and the works of Jesus. It doesn't work like that. It's a process for us to, to learn and to imitate and to become more like Jesus. And that's okay. But here's the, here's the thing. What's important though? is that we are actually maturing. It's important that we are actually uh, growing up because the trouble is that for some people, they never do grow up in their faith. And this is, a, this is an issue. Why? Because 
um, it means that we are more vulnerable and at a greater risk of being enticed away from Jesus because of the challenges of our culture and the challenges of self. You see, it is possible. You could be a Christian for many years, but still be an infant and a baby in terms of the development in certain areas of life because of the challenges of culture and the challenges of uh, the self. Um, some of our current challenges today are things like wrestling with, you know, post-modernity, uh, globalization, the age of authenticity, pluralism pluralism and more. All of these create significant uh, challenges in our desire to mature and to grow up and to be like Jesus. And beyond the cultural challenges, there's the challenges of the self. Uh, that is, all the unique individual obstacles which keep us stuck, paralyzed and afraid. Things such as our broken habits and sin, our need to be liked by others, our performance mentality, our lure and the lure of wealth, the idols of our heart, the things that steal our allegiances, and of course, our brokenness and our wounds, those moments of sadness and pain and, and tragedy. And so spiritual maturity growing up should be a priority for every Christian, because everything we do in life flows from everything that we are in King Jesus. And so there's nothing more important for us than a growing and maturing relationship with Jesus, a close relationship with him. So what does it take? What is it? What is it? What is, what is the environment that it needs and is conducive to maturing as followers of Jesus? Well, that's what we're going to look at today. So if you have your Bibles, you can go along and turn to Ephesians chapter four, and we'll be picking up in verse one through to 16 today. And if and because you're here online, uh, you can also check out the notes section uh, with us as well. And uh, remember, there's some going deeper questions and all sorts of other things in there that can help you uh, grow. But Ephesians 4.1 is where we're going to be stopping today. Um, now, just before we dive in, let me just uh, give a little bit of reminder of where we've been. In the lead up to Easter, uh, we spent a number of weeks looking at the first three chapters of Ephesians. And we called this part one, and we called it the gospel story. Uh, and the reason we did is because Paul spends the first three chapters uh, speaking about the beauty of the gospel and the marvelous uh, news and good news of our salvation or the wonderful things that uh, we have been invited into because we are now in Christ. And so that it, it was a big picture and beautiful picture view of the gospel. You'll recall that we looked at things like this, that we've been chosen by God, we've been lavished with his love, we've been adopted as his children, we have an inheritance through his son, we've been redeemed through his son, we've been gifted with the Holy Spirit, we've been reconciled to God, we've been saved by his death and life uh, of Jesus, and we can be grounded and founded in his marvellous love. And so there's some of the things that we, we looked at. And so Paul spent three chapters just unpacking the beauty of the gospel. Now he kind of changes gear and he now starts to speak in the next few chapters now, or well, the rest of the book, in fact, about uh, what are the implications, therefore, of being caught up in the beautiful gospel. And so this next part we're kicking off today is part two, and we're calling this part Our Story. And the reason for that is because here in the next few chapters and the rest of the book, Paul teaches us how to practically live out the gospel story and how it should shape and reshape every area of our life. And so we see this in verse 1. Just take a look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then, see that little word there? Then, it means that in light of everything shared so far, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have Receive. Paul is challenging us in light of everything we've looked at. Now, let's live this thing out in light of that. So let's dive in a little further and let's see what Paul says it takes to grow in faith in the environment that uh, means that we and others can grow in faith. Ephesians 4, 2-6, Paul says this, Be completely humble and gentle. 
Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Oh, just a beautiful piece of, of scripture. But here what Paul is doing, he's beginning this next section of the book, focusing on the body of Christ and the everyday life of Christians in the church. And he's encouraging the maintaining of unity that we have in God. And we know this because A, he says it, he encourages us to keep every effort to maintain the unity, but he uses this word one seven times. So this is important for Paul. This is important because Paul knows this. Paul knows that relationships are the primary context in which we grow and in which God grows us. You see, this may sound odd to you, but God has not personally given you everything you need to grow. Yes, we have the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit helps us to grow. But God's plan for our maturity involves us actually being involved in the body of Christ. And we need one another. We need each other so that we can grow and mature. We don't mature on our own. Maturing as a Christian is a team game. We need one another. Spiritual maturity happens best, you see, in the context of healthy Christian community that is unified. And that's what Paul is so concerned that we live in a, in a manner worthy of our calling and that we are focused on maintaining the unity that we have through Christ. Because a community that maintains unity is conducive for one's mature and spiritual growth. So how do we do this? How is it that we can maintain unity? Well, the good news is today in this passage that we've just read that Paul actually tells us he doesn't leave us guessing. He makes it really clear how it is that we can be part of maintaining unity. Let's take a look and see. He says this, verse 2, by being completely humble, gentle, patient, and by bearing with one another in love. He gives us four attitudes, behaviors, virtues that are essential ingredients for everyone who counts themselves a follower of Jesus, for everyone who wants to live a life worthy of the calling that we've received, for everyone who wants to contribute to the unity of their church community. And so these are not, for Paul, we need to recognize, these are not just optional extras, kind of lifestyle things that we can tap on to the end of what we do. These are the essential ingredients. And why are these four so important? Well, I think the reason why they're so important is because the opposites of them, living out the opposites of these four traits, are actually unity breakers. And so Paul knows the importance of embracing these four things and relinquishing the opposites, which are unity breakers. And so I want to spend just a bit of time looking at what, are the, what do we need to do to maintain unity? What do we need to relinquish in our life? And what do we need to embrace? And the first thing that we need to relinquish to maintain unity is we need to relinquish self-importance and we need to embrace humility. See, if you and I are honest, most of our energy is directed towards the self and its perspective, its desires and its, and its wants. But a heart occupied primarily with its own advancement, its own interest or comfort, a heart that is not moved by compassion for the other will ultimately cause division and disunity. May we not be impressed with our own self-importance or ambition, but may we embrace the low way. It's the way of humility. It's the way of Jesus. It's the way of the cross. Can you imagine the difference that it would make in our relationships and in the unity of the church if people knew that right up front we actually sought their best interests and we had no desire of promoting ourselves or lifting ourselves up by putting others down. If we want to maintain unity here at RBC, we need to relinquish self-importance and we need to embrace humility. Secondly, maintaining unity here takes relinquishing aggression 
and embracing gentleness. If there was ever a moment that gentleness was needed, it is now. We live in an age of social media feuds, cancel culture, war, political polarization. And so the way of gentleness, the gentle voice, is actually a radical countercultural voice. It's a, a radical way of living in a world of cruelty, aggression, rage, and hate. And in the church, embracing gentleness is critical because healthy relationships cannot exist under aggression, bullying, or force. It just doesn't work that way in the church or in the kingdom of God. You see, gentleness creates an environment of sensitivity, respect, safety, and nurture. Gentleness means that we deal with others with kindness, not harshness, with compassion, not cruelty, and with encouragement, not force or bullying. And so while gentleness is important in all of our relations and relationships and most definitely in the church, perhaps the place that it's actually most important is within the family and within the family home. You see, the family home is meant to be a place of love, safety and, and flourishing for all. But all too often, so much emotional, spiritual and physical damage is done there through harsh words and through aggression and abuse. And so can I just be really clear this morning that family and domestic violence and abuse is never okay, never okay. But especially if you're one who claims and counts themselves as a follower of Jesus. And by domestic abuse, I mean an incident or a pattern of incidents of controlling, coercive, threatening, degrading and violent behaviour. This is not the way of Jesus. It is not the way of gentleness and it is never okay and it needs to stop now. So if family violence is part of your story, then we encourage you and we will support you in getting the help that you need. So please reach out, please speak to one of the pastoral team, one of the elders, and we would love to be able and want to be able to encourage and support you in that. Because we need to be people as followers of Jesus who relinquish aggression, it is never okay, and embrace gentleness. Maintaining unity, Paul says, also requires relinquishing hurry and our own agendas and to embrace patience. See, you and I, we live in a fast-paced 24-7 FOMO culture. It's one of restlessness, busyness, overload, anxiety, and angst. Um, psychologists have actually uh, believed now and discovered that many of us suffer from something that they're calling hurry sickness. Uh, hurry sickness is defined as a behavioral pattern characterized by continual rushing and anxiousness or an uncomfortable feeling in which someone feels chronically short of time and so performs every task faster and gets flustered when they encounter any kind of delay. Now, I wonder, do you, do you resonate with this? You know, if I'm honest, hurry sickness impacts my life from time to time. And John Mark Comer says this, that hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life. Hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life. But it's also the great enemy of unity. And why? Because it can create fragile surface level friendships because we don't spend enough time with people, getting to know people, hearing people's story because we are too busy with our schedule and what is next and hurrying along to the next thing. You see, to be patient here also means that we value other people enough to give them room and time to fail, to learn and to develop, which may not be in line with the speed of our plans or our agenda or in line with our timeline. But this is important if we are going to cultivate and maintain unity. So what's the solution to hurry sickness? Is it to create a few extra hours in the day? Well, no, time is, is not the answer. Rather, the answer is to relinquish our own agendas and to embrace patience. You see, patience allows us to slow down, to see people, to hear God's voice and to yield 
and yield to our constant desire to fill our schedules up. So fourthly, maintaining unity requires relinquishing our rights and our need to be right and rather embracing tolerant love. You see, we focus so much on our rights, and even though they are important, we must be willing to give up our rights and put up with people in love. You see, insisting on one's rights never leads to healthy relationships. The invitation for the follower of Jesus, is, of course, is that we are called to follow him, and that means to lay down our life for the sake of another. In Christian community, this will mean laying down our preferences, tolerating some ways of doing things that we are not fully satisfied with. It will also mean this. It will also mean giving up our need to be right about everything. Shane Willard, uh, who's a preacher and author, and he he says this. he, He says, if the world sees us in conflict, may the Christ that holds us all together be glorified more than we need to be right about something. I love that. And that is my prayer for us as a community, that if ever we find ourselves in places of disunity, that if the world looks in on us, that they would see Jesus in our midst more than our need to be right about something. So there's four Four things that, four behaviors and traits and virtues that Paul says we need to embrace, and four attitudes that we need to relinquish if it is that if we are going to maintain unity uh, in our community. But he goes on, he goes on in verse seven, and he, he, he begins now to say there's something else, it's a second thing. We also, if we are going to create an environment that people mature in, we also need an environment and a community where everyone contributes their gifts. Take a look, verse, uh, verse seven says this, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to what? To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So you'll notice the shift here from Paul, from all of us language to each one of us language. Now, just to be clear here, each one of us, in the Greek, it actually means each one of us. This is really important. It means male, female, young, old. It means each one of us. You see, unity uh, does not equal uniformity. Uh, We can be unified, but each one of us has a special contribution to make to see our community here at RBC flourish and people to be able to grow and become mature. You see, God's family doesn't all look the same. It'd be so boring if we're all just the same, but rather the church consists consists of lots of different kinds of people with unique gifts. Now, the gifts that Paul uh, lists here are that of apostle, pastor, evangelist, shepherd, and teacher. Now, just a few things I just want to say about this. Firstly, this list Uh, is not an exhaustive list. There are other lists that Paul has in his letters that speak about other spiritual gifts. And so we need to look at the whole sweep of, of Scripture and the spiritual gifts that are listed to identify our own. But Paul's big idea here is simple. It's to say that God has given his church a beautiful array of gifts to help the church grow and to see people flourish and mature in their faith. Now, with all that said, I do actually find that this list of five gifts is actually a super helpful one for us, where we might be able to look at our kingdom strengths and where we might actually have the best kingdom impact. And so we're not going to look at this today just because of time But if you'd like to discover your kingdom strengths and where you might have the most kingdom impact, then I encourage you to scan the QR codes that you'll see on the screen. These QR codes lead to two different tests. 
uh, that I recommend, that I believe can help you if you want to go further in understanding your giftedness. One is just a little five minute uh, simple free test, but a great one. And the other is a 10 minute test uh, that costs $10 and just a little more comprehensive. And so I want to just recommend and encourage these to you. So why don't you go ahead and, and scan them and uh, this week or maybe later on today, just take some time to discover your kingdom strengths and your uh, where you might have the most kingdom impact. Secondly, it's important to stress that these gifts are not about creating any special people. Uh, rather, the opposite is true. Paul is affirming that the mission of God is in the hands of all people. It's in the hands of ordinary people like you and me. It's not just uh, in the hands of the ordained. God's mission and ministry is for the many, not for the few. Every one of us has been called to build up the body of Christ using our unique gifts. And it's important to note that our gifts are not uh, ultimately from ourselves or because of our own doing, but they are gifts that have been graced to us from God for the benefit and the blessing of God's people, the body of Christ, the church, so that people can grow mature. And here's the, here's the thing with that. It means that none of us benefit if you actually bury your gifts. Are you burying your gifts? Did you have gifts, but you're choosing not to use them or not contribute them for whatever reason? Well, no one benefits. You don't benefit from that. But our, com our community here uh, doesn't benefit either. We are less because of uh, people not contributing their gifts here. And this is why it's important that everyone plays their part and contributes their gifts. It's why as a church we encourage people to serve and it's why one of our next steps is to get involved and to contribute and to use your gifts because when we do we are better, we are stronger, we have a better environment here for people to grow and to mature in their faith. So Paul says here a community of faith that maintains unity and sees and encourages people contributing their gifts this creates an environment that is conducive to people growing up in their faith. And this is what Paul goes on and he says in this next section in verse 14, he says this, Then, because of all that's gone before, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Amen. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Now, Shane Willard says that uh, a sermon isn't meant to be agreed with nor disagreed with, but it is meant to be wrestled with. And so let's just take a moment to wrestle with what we have just heard. And so let me just do that by asking a few questions. Do you live with a sense of gratefulness to God for RBC, for the body of believers that he's placed you in here? When was the last time that you thanked God for this community that you are part of? Are you maintaining unity here or are you participating in a way that is breaking unity? Are you, are you furthering unity through being humble, being patient, being gentle and showing tolerant love? Or are you breaking community through uh, being, you know, living a life of and modeling self-importance, aggression, uh, wanting your own rights, and hurrying through life. For the sake of your own spiritual life, do you need to relinquish hurry and embrace patience? Is that something that you need to do? I wonder, is there any area of your life that you need to relinquish aggression and embrace gentleness? Is that something that needs to happen in your home? Are you burying your gifts? The unique gifts that God has given you for the blessings and the benefits of the church, are you just burying them? 
Are you using your gifts for your own advancement or for the maturing of your community? This is a motive of the heart, this one, right? Well, number seven, how are you or how might you start contributing your gifts here for the benefit and the blessing of others? What's your next step? Maybe you're not involved. Maybe you're not serving in any way. How can you contribute, whether it be on a Sunday or in many ways, many, many ways throughout the week? Well, as we close today, I want to leave us with uh, just verses 8 to 10. And it says this, When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Now, you might have noticed that I had skipped over these verses early, and I, I did that because, in all honesty, they are some of the most puzzling verses in the whole letter. And it's actually difficult to truly understand uh, Paul's reasons for putting this in and his actual uh, intent. But I also left them till now because whatever Paul's exact intention may have been for their inclusion, they serve as a very clear reminder to us that Jesus is the one who descended and ascended, that descended from heaven and ascended to heaven. You see, we can't maintain unity on our own. We don't, the gifts that we, ha that we have are not anything of our own making. They are gifts from God because of the life of Jesus and the giving of the Holy Spirit. Everything that we have is because of the person of Jesus. Jesus is the one that is holding all things together. He is the one who will ultimately descend again when he, when he reunites heaven and earth again and finally brings all things into unity once and for all. This is God's big agenda to one day see all things come under, under Christ in full unity. You see, Jesus was the one who humbled himself he was the one who relinquished his rights and position for the sake of love. Jesus is the one who relinquished power, who, who didn't retaliate or use aggression. Instead, he showed us the power of patience and gentleness by going to the cross for your sin and mine. And it was in that act that saw the salvation of the world and so that you and I can be caught up in the very life of God. Jesus was completely humble, completely gentle, completely patient and completely loving with everyone he met and has been incredibly humble, gentle, patient and loving in all of his dealings with you and I. Let us come and let us just thank him. Let's just thank Jesus today and let us also pray that we would continue to be a community that maintains the union that we have in him and one where gifts are, are contributed for the benefit and the blessing of our community. So Jesus, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are the truly humble, gentle, patient and loving one. And Lord, we want to be those who imitate you in all areas of our life because we want to be those who maintain unity within the life of our church because it is our heart that people would flourish, that people would mature, that people would grow up in Christ. And so, Lord, we just pray that by your spirit, you would continue to help us be those people who embrace these four virtues of humility, gentleness, patience and tolerant love, we pray. Lord, we pray, too, that we would be a community who would uh, see gifts flourish, that would see people contribute their gifts for the benefit and the blessing of others. Lord, we we know that it takes a community for people to grow in maturity. So may we be unified, but may the gifts that we offer, uh, the gifts that have come from you and that flow through us, may they go into the lives of others and be a blessing and a benefit for them. Ultimately, Lord, so that more people would be able to experience a life-changing relationship with you. So Jesus, we give you all the praise and all the glory 
And we pray it all in your name. Amen.